It is a, a certainly a, a dramatic time in Israel's history, and I think we can extrapolate some personal lessons for us. G, who actually becomes a challenge to us because he has a lot of energy and enthusiasm for the things of God. And for those of us that have been in the truth for a long, long time, of course, this is, this is helpful to us because it, it means that we want to re-energise ourselves in preparation for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we've um, shown before, of course, we've got a, a series of five studies that we want to do. And in our last session, we had a look at selection. Remember, the uh, son of the prophet came to anoint um, Jehu. He did so with enthusiasm and um, Jehu was off and running and we saw the, the finish point where he was sort of driving towards Jezreel, uh, ready to exterminate the, the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. So tonight we want to have a look a little bit more about the seriousness of Jehu. Uh, it wasn't just a flash in the pan, it wasn't just that he wanted to be king and so you know he wanted to usurp the uh, existing dynasty and take the throne for himself. He wanted more than that. He actually wanted to remove um, anyone who had a bad influence upon the nation of Israel. And you remember we pointed out in verse 6 that he was anointed so that he could create an environment for the people of Israel to return to their God. And the particular phrase here in verse 6 is the people of the Lord. And we might have thought, of course, the Northern Territory, of course, was all um, completely astray from the truth and, and disconnected from God. But here in this particular phrase, that was his commission. Uh, to restore again the environment so the people of God could return to their right worship. And he took that seriously, and we'll see that tonight. So he had a very clear understanding of what his commission was to do. He had zero tolerance for anyone who was a bad influence, anyone who was distracting from the worship of God, and he wanted to restore that environment again. And he had that energy and that enthusiasm. He just, didn't drag his heels and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll sort of organise things and, and eventually we'll, this will happen. He just went full on into removing this, this whole dynasty and anyone that was connected with Baal worship. So, as we said tonight, our subject is um, seriousness. Uh, we've got this particular section that we've just read and our key verse for sure, and, and it's going to be challenging for us, is verse 24 where he draws this bow with his full strength. And you can see that determination, that focus that he has on exploring the opportunity to open up an environment for right worship for his God. So, you know, we might have had a pre preconceived idea that Jehu was just a military machine. I think we'll find out tonight that he's more than that. He really wanted to begin a new process in the land of Israel. So we begin at verse 21. Here's where we uh, left off last session. And we notice there, remember that Jehu was coming in with his chariot. He, he wheels into the, the city of, of Jezreel and he's going to take out these kings and the queen, of course, all in a day. So verse 21, the, the king has sent out a couple of watchmen, remember, and they were wondering why Jehu was coming down, obviously, with a bit of an entourage. They presumed that it was going to be good news, that he'd had success on the battlefield. They didn't know that this was a, a rebellion or an assassination attempt. So they're going to saddle up, they're going to go out because he's the general chief of staff, uh, and they're going to inquire, how's it going on the battlefield? You're bringing good news. So they didn't know, and they weren't aware of, of what was going to unfold. So verse 21, Jor uh, Joram says, make ready, and his chariot raid was made ready. He's the king, of course. So both the kings, king of Judah and king of Israel, went out to um, meet Jehu on his way in. Now you notice there's a great little phrase here in this narrative. It says, they each in his chariot and they went out against Jehu and met him significantly in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. So there's, there's a geographical marker that's injected into this verse that is particularly important. Now you'll notice in your margin you've got King James on that word met. It actually gives the Hebrew word as found. So they found him in the field of Naboth. Now Jehu has already set this up because there's a bit of background. He knows the prophecy by uh, Elijah many years before against Ahab that there was going to be judgment meted out on Ahab himself in the field of Naboth. So he doesn't go screaming in to the city of Jezreel. He stops in the field of Naboth. And that's that, that Hebrew word there, matzah. Margin says he found. First occurrence, here's an example, Genesis 2 verse 20 is the first occurrence. It says there was not found for Adam a help for him. So it's not just they met or some random chance that, well, they happened to cross paths in the, in the field of Naboth. It's Jehu came in and they found him 
in, in that particular area. So it's as though he is waiting in that spot to execute his commission. So again, you know, just this little background, he's not just going in for the kill. There's a whole spiritual significance of fulfilling a prophecy and a commission originally given by Elijah, and now he's going to execute the rightness and the justness of God. Well, so, you know, as they come in, their question in verse 22 is, is it peace? A word peace, we point out, is the word shalom. Is everything happened? It's probably a, a fairly typical greeting uh, in, in Israel today. But of course, what's really interesting, and I think we probably coloured in these, or maybe you didn't last session, and it's worthwhile colouring in, because this is a repeated phrase right through this particular chapter over six times. The question is, is it peace? Of course, the answer is no, because the nation is infested with evil. So there, there is no peace, of course. And right through that narrative, that's, that's the question. And it was Jehu's task originally to establish a form of peace. And as we've got there, true peace only comes when there's an eradication of evil. We understand that, we know that, that's why we want the return of Jesus Christ. And this world is, is such a complex world, it's such a frustrating world. Uh, it's a world that's full of a, a lot of issues and problems on, on many different levels. But until corruption and evil and wickedness is removed, it'll, it'll be always the same thing. So that's the whole plan and purpose of God is to remove that and then true peace, shalom, happiness will be for all people. So those phrases are repeated. And of course, we've got the, uh, the qualifying quotations there in Isaiah 57. It says, the wicked are like a troubled sea, a can't rest, the waters cast up mire and dirt. There's turbulence there. We see that in our world today. People are unrestful, they're unhappy, they want some change, they want some newness. They can't find it. And so the quote says, no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Again, in Isaiah 59, they don't know the way of peace. And Jeremiah chapter 8 uh, says, They'd heal, They have healed the wound of my people, that's Israel, lightly. They said, Oh, look, it's not a big issue, of course. And they're saying, Peace, peace. These prophets who are giving very depressive messages, it's not going to happen. There's going to be peace. And God says, Well, there's not going to be peace at all while there's evil in existence. So this was the big commission for Jehu was, of course, to remove that so that there would be peace. So what's, what's his answer? So the kings come out, Shalom, is it peace? Is it well? Is it good news? And they, they meet a rebuttal by Jehu in verse 22. And he says, well, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. So Jehu had no time for Jezebel and her excess practices as far as Baal worship or Asher, Asher worship and idolatry and murder were concerned. He had no time for Jezebel or Ahab or that whole system at all. So again, he's not just strategically positioning himself so he could have the glory of the throne. He just didn't like that Baal worship at all. He wanted to be true and faithful worship of God. So this wasn't just about the practices uh, uh, that Jezebel had incorporated. There's a whole spiritual dimension and component to the deterioration of the nation of Israel, the state of the nation. He wasn't happy about it at all. So again, we're getting a little bit of an insight into this man Jehu and how his mind was working. Zero tolerance for evil and wickedness. So we note that the kings recognise that. They turn around in verse 23. They make a, a run for it. And, of course, we've got that little quote in verse 24 where, and I just love this characteristic attribute of Jehu, it's full-on strength. It says in verse 24, Jehu, drew, and, and the narrative really expands right out, I guess it's like a bow being pulled. Uh, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and he smote draw right between the arms, right, and the arrow went out on his heart. I mean, you couldn't get anything more dramatic or more descriptive, really. It's not like, you know, he pulled up and the arrow went and he died. It's like full strength. It tells us it smote him right between the shoulders and came out of his heart. I mean, that's a, that's a target hit if there was ever a target hit. So spot on, no mistaking, centre point, absolutely fatal for the king. And I think one translation says it went right through his heart. So we're getting an indication here of, of that strength that Jehu has when it comes to evil and wickedness and his desire to eradicate it. He went straight for the target, straight for the heart. And that's got to be a challenge for us. Here are some quotations to put against that little phrase, uh, with his full strength, because 
We've got to think about our own lives. No point just look studying this and, well, that's dramatic and that's interesting. Where do we sit when it comes to full strength and service to God? So here's some quotation to put against uh, verse 24, where that little phrase is full strength, because this is the challenge to us. And here's some individuals who put full strength into their service for God. Where, where do we sit with all that, brothers and sisters? You know, do we find it tough when it's a bit cold and we've got to come out, it's raining? Um, you know, these men really went through a lot of physical difficulties to demonstrate their love for God. That's what we do when we're here tonight. You know, credit to you all for coming out tonight and, and sitting together and opening God's word. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so here's, of course, Hezekiah. <clears throat> it says, in every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God, in accordance with the law of command, see, he did it with his whole heart. He was fully invested in his service to his God. I might, might even say, you know, like 24-7. Uh, Ecclesiastes, of course, is obviously a great parallel. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, because there's nothing near beyond the opportunities that we have now to serve God. You know, once you get old to start to creep up into the 60s like I am, <laughs> or a little bit older, you, your physical faculties start, start to fail and you can't do it with full strength. And memories start to you know, blur a little bit more. So we need to take those opportunities. Uh, here's Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, Numbers 13.30. Caleb quieted the people. He said, no, we can go up, we can take this. You know, those giants, they're not giants at all. With God's strength, we can do this. We are well able to overcome it. Um, there's his energy for moving into the promised land. And then we go, jump across in the New Testament, these beautiful quotations by Paul. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a man, of course, who, who bore on his body many physical marks of persecution. And yet he continued to press forward. He said, I can do all these things. Colossians 3.22, he encouraged us, whatever you do, brothers and sisters, do it from the heart as to the Lord and not just unto men. It's our whole demeanour and our approach to life, whether that's our worth, work ethic or whether it's our behaviour, our attitude, our service to each other. Romans 12, 11, don't be slothful, be fervent in, in spirit. And 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul sort of talks about our walk to the kingdom or our run to the kingdom. He says, in a race, there's lots of people running but only one person gets the prize. The whole point. So he says, brothers and sisters, run like you want to be in first place. Now we know, of course, in the kingdom, it's not going to be first, second, third prize that's handed out by Christ. But what he's saying is, you know, run like you want to win. Don't just, don't just you know, well, I hope it all works out and fingers crossed I'm going to get a place in God's kingdom. It's like, well, there's got to be determination and full strength. So there, you know, some, it's an immediate challenge from the energy and the enthusiasm of Jehu as to, to where we are, do we, here's the question, do we give full strength in our service to God? How serious are we about evil? And I think it's a great challenge for 2022. In a world that has blurred every moral boundary that you can think of, how serious are we about eradicating evil in our own lives? Because we sort of, you know, tolerate it now. Well, it's not a big deal, is it? Whereas for Jehu, Arrow straight through to the heart, got rid of it. And that, that's a challenge to us. Do we accommodate evil? Do we tolerate it? Now, I can remember back when we were at Suburban, we were hosting Suburban, we were there with a lot of you know, young people and we used to have pretty rigorous talks that were very straight down the line. I remember talking to a young brother after, he said, oh, that was an amazing talk uh, last week. He said, Uncle Steve, I went home and I snapped 200 CDs in half. This is when you used to put CDs in cars and play, you know, rock music. <laughs> and he had apparently quite a big collection. But he was so enthusiastic about a particular talk, he said, I went home and I snapped 200 CDs in half and put them in the bin. <laughs> and I always remember that because I thought, wow, that's a, amazing. That, um, but, but it's right, isn't it? I mean, we listen to talks, we, go home, we yawn, we go home and life continues on. So, you know, these are challenges for us that are really good. And I see Jehu, as he pulled that, you know, right, and I've sort of, and Mike is going to laugh at this, but we went to Texas a few years ago, and there's a brother that had a bow and arrow, and I could not draw the bow back. <laughs> I tried a couple of times. I got to about here, and then I just couldn't do it. So I fully appreciate the strength that Jehu's got. Full strength, straight to the target, straight through the heart. Incredible. So, uh, and why is he doing this? 
Is it just because he wants to be on the throne? No, look at this narrative now in verse 25. Then said Jehu to Bidka, his captain, throw his body in the field of, of, of Naboth. For I remember when you and I rode together with Ahab, his father, Yahweh laid this burden upon him. Now, I like that word, I remember. That was 15 years before. 15 years before when he was riding with Bidkar as bodyguards to Ahab. A conversation that he remembered occurred between Ahab and Elijah. So you wind back to 2007, 15 years ago, 2007. Can you remember a phrase, a talk, a point in a study that resonated with you, that you know, you've carried for 15 years thinking, that, that was a great point, that changed my life. Because Jehu did. He remembered a conversation that occurred 15 years before and it resided in his mind and now it's going to be outplayed and fulfilled. So he obviously is a general or chief of staff in the army. He continued to serve Ahab, but he didn't agree with Ahab's immorality and his rejection of God. He didn't agree with it at all. So he cites in verse 25 and 26... Uh, the, the prophecy that was given by Elijah. And he, he knew that because he was there. He heard that pronunciation. And ESV says, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab. Now, this is, I happen to look up a few Assyrian inscriptions, and this is basically some inscriptions, obviously, from the Assyrian Empire. And you can see here they ride together. So it's not just on the back of a horse or you know, in a chariot by yourself. Here's, here they are here. They're all in this particular chariot together. And here's one. You can see here's the king here and here's all his bodyguards around. So obviously Jehu heard that whole conversation and that pronouncement by Elijah. So he had every justification to take Ahab out. He heard that conversation. I mean, he's the top military man. He could have taken Ahab out at any point because he would have felt that he's fulfilling a divine commission, but he waited for that particular anointing. But here's the interesting point, and he adds something in which is not in the previous record. I'm going to go there in a minute, but look at verse 26. Uh, this is what he recalls the conversation. He says, Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth, and here it is, and the blood of his sons, saith Yahweh. So if you think about the story of Naboth, I know Pip did it last year or the year before, I don't know if you remember, but it wasn't just Naboth that died. We've probably got, just come back to First um, Kings 21, because it's, it's mentioned, well, it's not mentioned there, actually. If you read the record from First Kings 21, you would never know that Ahab and Jezebel basically took out the whole family. So when you come to 1 Kings 21 and verse 13, uh, it just talks about um, two men, uh, children of worthlessness, and they sat and the whole thing happened. But at the end of verse 13, it says, Then they carried him, singular, forth out of the city and stoned him, singular, with the stones that he died, singular. And then they sent a message to Jezebel saying, well, Naboth's dead. You wouldn't know that the, the sons, plural, were killed as well. They took out the whole family. So Ahab could possess that particular plot of land. So Jehu was there. He heard all this. He knew all this. He hated it. He hated the brutality and the callousness and the injustice of this Ahab and Jezebel. And an innocent man, Naboth, and they killed his sons as well who had the right to inheritance, Jehu didn't like that at all. Now, you might say, well, why was Jehu a warrior? Why was he still serving Ahab? Well, he could, because he believed that Israel had a right to their inheritance. That's the whole point. He was fighting against these other nations because he believed that was God's land. That was God's promise. He was defending the inheritance. So to see and to witness someone removed, killed, murdered inappropriately would have been quite distasteful for him. 
But Jehu, like we might even say like David, remember David was anointed as king, but for 15 years he ran through the wilderness, waiting, 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 waiting for the moment when God would open a pathway for him to become king. So Jehu parallels in a very similar way uh, David's attitude as well. So Ahab died in battle 12 years before this incident we're, we're talking about tonight, when Jehu finally killed Ahab. Uh, killed um, the other king, Joram. So he died 12 years previous to that, but Jehu knew that there were still some details in this prophecy that had not been fulfilled. So in some sense, like David, he was waiting for a commission, for an anointment, for a direction from God to fulfil that. And here it comes. It's here in this 1 Kings 21, verse 23. Here's a part of the prophecy that had not been fulfilled because Ahab died... 12 years before, but Jezebel was still alive. So verse 23, and he heard this conversation with Elijah and of Jezebel also spake the Lord saying, dogs will eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Just have a look at your margin as well on that word wall. It's the word ditch, isn't it? See, Jehu heard this conversation and he's actually going to fulfil it to the letter that remained unfulfilled. And that was very specific about how Jezebel was going to die. She wasn't going to die on the field of Naboth. She wasn't going to die on a battlefield. She was going to die in a ditch. And Jehu was going to make sure that that was fulfilled. So what I'm saying is, Jehu is not just a military person. He likes to kill people. He actually wants to re-establish a right environment for worship. And here's, here's the point. Just come back to our chapter, 2 Kings 9. There's another little colouring in point here. Jehu is citing not his own authority. He's not saying, look, I'm doing this because you're a nasty person and I want to get rid of your mother because uh, you're a nasty fan. He doesn't say that at all. He says it's by the word of God. So he knew the prophecy. He knew his Bible. And here it is here. Four times I was with Ahab, his father. The Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I've seen you said the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Seth the Lord... And I'll require thee in this place, saith the Lord. Now therefore take a cast him in that uh, place of the ground according to the word of the Lord. So that's a, a little phrase worth colouring in. Four times, Jehu is not saying, well, this is what I want. He's saying, this is part of the fulfilment of the word of God. Now, and come across to verse 36. Because again, in verse 36, he quotes the words of Elijah. Verse 36, wherefore they came again and told him, and he said... Well, that's great, you know, this is my doing, I'm glad I got rid of Jezebel. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, this is the word of Yahweh which he spake by Elijah. So he gives credibility to God and to his word. So for Jehu, he waited until the time came when that opportunity opened up. Do we have, here's the question again, do we have the same energy, the same enthusiasm in enthusiasm in wanting to establish and progress the kingdom of Christ. Because when the command comes for us to clean up the world, morally, physically, spiritually, are we going to give full strength to engage with Christ and progress the kingdom? Because I think our viewpoint is, hey, I hope I get to the kingdom point and then, I don't know, I guess I'll be sitting under a fig tree and relaxing. <laughs> it's just the opposite. This is like just our period of waiting, like Jehu. And when the anointing or the command comes, we will have a thousand years now with full strength to go out and to establish the kingdom. Is that what we want? Is that what we're really waiting for? Because that's got to be the focus, not me just getting the kingdom. It's me changing the world with Jesus Christ to make it a better place for everybody to worship God. So we're going to be looking forward to beyond the judgment seat to transforming this world into the place that God wants it to be. So when that command comes for us, brothers and sisters, what a relief, what a privilege, what a joy. How much enthusiasm we'll have to change this world so that it becomes a nice place for everybody. So he cites in verse 25, 26, the words of God. And uh, that, that was particularly important for Jehu, of course, to fulfil. And again, New Testament quotation across in Peter. It says, all flesh is like grass. People come, people go. The glory of man is like a flower of the, the grass. The grass withers, 
and the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and you've got that gospel message that is enduring. So that's something that's permanent and solid and reliable for us in a very transitory world. So verse 27, there's another little point here, very interesting. Verse 27 says, When Ahaziah, king of Judah, so Joram, king of Israel, had an arrow through his heart. He's dead. His body's been put out in the field of Naboth. Ahaziah now in verse 27, king of Judah, thinks, oh, I'm going to make a run for it because he's after me as well. It says he fled by the way of the, the garden house. It's almost an echo, isn't it, of, of Naboth and Ahab, uh, the, the, the confrontation they had. Remember, Ahab said, I want this for a garden. I mean, this was Naboth's vineyard. And now history almost is, is, is being justified as this king fled by the way of a, a garden house. ESV says he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan, a slight translation. So we don't know whether it's a place um, or just the way the King James, but interesting um, analogy anyway. So Ahaziah is on the run. He's 23 years of age. He's been on the throne for 12 months. Uh, his mother is Athaliah, who was the sister of the king that's just his body's been thrown in the field of Naboth. So there's a big family interconnection going on here. He's 23. He's only been on the throne for one year. That's, all, that, that's the length of his reign. So he heads off, and the record at the end of verse 27 says he headed off to Megiddo, which was a big fortress town. Didn't make it, uh, and the record there says, uh, and, he, and he died there. But I want you to go to Second um, Chronicles 22, verse 9, because this is a, the parallel record in Chronicles. It adds another little really interesting detail, because from that narrative there in Kings, you get the picture, well, uh, it looks, looks like King Ahaziah just made a run for it, but somehow he, he died. Was he wounded or, or what happened? Well, Second Chronicles 22, verse 9, fills in the picture for us and shows the energy and the enthusiasm that Jehu and his men around him had for eradicating evil. Second Chronicles 22 verse 8 says, It came to pass that when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, etc., etc., um, he slew them. Verse 9, look at verse 9. And he sought Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria, and they brought him to Jehu, and they slew him there. <coughs> so, point is, Jehu didn't let him get away. He could have probably shrugged, shrugged, shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you know, best of luck to him. He's making a run for it. After all, he's the king of Judah. Maybe we should let him go. No, he was connected to the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. He was an evil and wicked man. Jehu sought for him, found him and killed him. So again, this is indicating the thoroughness of Jehu. He didn't leave any stone unturned. He wanted to remove every bad influence. And, of course, the lesson coming out to us is that we've got to be careful with our associations, don't we, with our friendships, especially when it comes to people in the world. Not that, of course, we're going to shut the door or not have a conversation with anyone. We've got to live in this world. We want to be nice people. We want to communicate to everyone. We want to invite them to be part of the kingdom. So we do have to be friendly, of course, but the depth of our friendships, that's, that's an important thing. There are times where we have to draw a line in the sand and say, look, no, what you're asking me to be involved in, I don't want to be involved in at all. Because historically, of course, winding back a little bit, Jehoshaphat, remember, Jehoshaphat made an alliance with Ahab and with Jezebel, and he allowed his son to be married into that dynasty. And, of course, that gave rise to Athaliah, the evil, wicked woman, who now, down in Judah, was going to take control Athaliah, of course, was in the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. She's going to kill all her grandkids and take the throne. I mean, what evil, wicked people they were. So the point of this little record here with this coordination between the king of Israel and the king of Judah is, hey, be careful of what association you make. It could <coughs> devastate, it could destroy you spiritually. Just be really careful. That, that is part of the point. And, of course, Paul picks that up as well in the New Testament, when in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the chapter on the resurrection, he just inserts this little comment. He says, don't fool yourselves, bad friends will destroy you. Well, that really came to pass as far as Ahaziah was concerned. He's a young guy 
He'd only been on the throne for 12 months, got involved in the whole dynasty of the, the Northern Territories, and he ended up losing his life with Joram. Bad association, bad connection. Uh, and again, a couple of translations there. Don't be deceived. Um, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you. Associating with bad people will ruin decent people. So we know as far as the world is concerned, we've got to be friendly, we've got to be nice, we've got to communicate, but the depth and the extent and the length of our friendships, we have to be very, very careful with that because if we allow it to go too far, it can destroy us, literally. So we've got to be careful with our friendships. So I'm just drawing a lesson on this association that the two kings had together, how inappropriate in some ways it was. And of course, um, we've got to be careful with our choices and there's some beautiful quotations there. I don't know where to put that in 2 Kings chapter 9. I don't know, you know, verse 28 perhaps or 27, that this uh, connection of Ahaziah, king of Judah, with the king of Israel was not a good one. And, um, you know, our choice of friends, our brothers and sisters, is really, really helpful for us. That's the positive element of friendship. It's great. Other brothers and sisters, you know, can give us advice and help and encouragement. Maybe they go through the same issues that we are. So he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. That's exactly what happened to Ahaziah. And there's a, a few other quotations there as well. This one in a positive way, Malachi 3.16. Um, it talks about us, brothers and sisters, us here tonight. It says, those who feared the Lord got together, opened the Bible, talked about it, conversed about it, encouraged each other in it. And God noticed that and a book of remembrance was written. For the friends and the brothers and sisters who feared Yahweh and, and respected his name. So, you know, what we're doing tonight is a good thing. And those friendships are particularly important. So, you know, in light of this cooperation between Joram uh, and Ahaziah, we've got to ask our few, ourselves some questions. I don't know where your friendships are extending to. We've got to ask ourselves this question. Who am I around? Who am I hanging around mostly? What are they doing to me? What have they got me reading? What, what, what are we absorbing ourselves in? What are we connecting with? What have they got me saying? Where do they have me going? Where do they have me thinking? And what do they have me becoming? Because people around us influence us in a positive or a negative way. Then ask yourself the big question. Is that okay? Because our life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. So that's all we're saying. From this association of Ahaziah and Jor, bad, bad thing. They both lost their lives, bad decisions. We have to be careful with the depth of our friendships and what people are turning us into. When we're here around God's word, well, that's a great thing because that's a positive, renewing, upbuilding exercise. So, well, we come, of course, the narrative continues here in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, two kings down, uh, one, one queen to go. Uh, verse 30 says, And when Jehu has come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. <laughs> well, when you do the chronology, she's, 50, she's 55. Uh, no, no sort of implication or any of the older sisters that are 55 plus here. But, you know, I don't know. You, you know she obviously needs some face painting to make herself look you know, quite presentable. But the thing here, you might go down the path of what you trying to do, seduce Jehu, make yourself look nice. No, not at all. She knew where Jehu was going to go. He had a clear determination, arrow through the heart. Jezebel's not going to survive this. So here's a demonstration of what a hard-hearted woman she was. She's going to challenge Jehu and dress herself like a queen in her final, final moments. So she hears the news. The news filters back. King has been assassinated. Ahaziah has also been assassinated. She knew that Jehu's not going to show any mercy, so she's going to dress herself as the Queen Mother and cast an insult into his face. I'm going to unpack that a little bit toward the end of the narrative. So she was such a cold-hearted uh, Tyrian sorceress, we might say, because she was from Tyre, uh, that she was ready to meet Jehu in that particular moment. So, you know, she painted her eyelashes and, and put on her jewels and, and put beautiful robe on, mounted up into the top of the tower and looked down through the lattice as Jehu's riding in. 
and he comes thundering in with his chariot with his men and she hailed this triumphant usurper with a bitter insult the most bitterest of insults that she could cast into his face so where do we go with that well you notice in the margin it wasn't just that she actually painted her face <laughs> the margin says uh, put her eye in I think it's painting I can't read it. I need glasses like Pip um, well, the Hebrew means she set her eyes in paint. You're thinking, that's really weird. It was actually to make them a little bit larger. I've got a photograph there. So I, I went on a, a sideline on this because it sort of intrigued me what she was doing. So apparently she used a, a chemical substance called antimony, or the, the chemical substance now is called stibnite. And it's used by ancient Egyptians as an eye cosmetic owing to its rich black colour. I'm sort of thinking she could have just asked Elijah. I'm pretty sure he would have given her a couple of black eyes. But anyway, she used this special colouring to make her eyes black. Apparently it's poisonous if you inhale it. If you eat it, it's carcinogenic. And then I went off on a slight distraction, which I thought was very interesting. So this substance had a medicinal effect back through the Middle Ages. So it was used for eye makeup, and it was also used for skin medi uh, medication. And also, you'll be interested in this, it was a widespread, widespread practice for pellets of stibnite to be swallowed to induce vomiting and as a laxative. This was in tune with the medical belief of the times that bad humours needed to be expelled from the body. Not tumours, humours. So I'm, I'm thinking if you're grumpy, you need to take a few of these pellets. I don't know, that's the me medicinal, the scientific advice at the time. And then it went on, it was an expensive metal, and so the pellets were often retrieved for reuse and even passed from generation to generation. So that's the ultimate in recycling. <laughs> but getting back to the eye shadow, um, another little historical comment says, the Persians differ as much from us in their notions of beauty as they do, do in taste. So what it's saying is the Persians, actually it's an appealing thing to have black eyes. Um, this writer, who wrote back in the 1800s, says, a large, soft and languishing black eye which then constitutes the perfection of beauty. It is chiefly on this account that women use the power of antimony, which is this, which although it adds to the vi vivacity of the eye, it throws a kind of voluptuous languor over it, which makes it appear dissolving in bliss. <laughs> The Persian women have a curious custom of making their eyebrows meet. And if this charm be denied them, they paint their foreheads with a preparation made for that purpose. So apparently one eyebrow is very attractive to Persians. <laughs> well, anyway, here's Jezebel. I slightly detract. Here's Jezebel. She's painting her eyes to look very voluptuous. And the record goes on to say she tired, tired her head or adorned herself with a headdress. So she put on this tiara, she put on the royal crown, she put on the royal apparel, and her object was not to captivate Jehu, but to overawe and to intimidate him. Here she is, face to face, almost like eyeball to eyeball with Jehu. I'm going to take you down. So she, she put all this on. Now, you might like to jot this little quote against, you know, paint her face there in verse 30, uh, Jeremiah 4 and verse 30, because there's a reference there to it. We won't go, I'll cite it for you. Jeremiah 4 verse 30, it's, it's to the people of Israel who were, were really making overtures to the surrounding nations and rejecting God's worship. This, this is what the quote says. And you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself in garments or ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourself, your lovers despise you, they seek your life. So Israel was copying the practices of the world. This is really what God was saying. They were enlarging their eyes with paint. This is what Jezebel is doing here. So she was very fastidious to look good on the outside. Now, you look at that picture there. That's not Jezebel there. I'll show you Jezebel. I've actually got a, an original photograph of her. <laughs> that's, I think that's probably more like what Jezebel really looked like. Probably on the inside more on the outside but of course you know this whole makeover that she's going to do is really going to be pointless because she's going to need a real work over after um, Jehu's finished with her for sure well here's where she eyeballs Jehu as he comes in and look what she says to him from the window verse 31 as Jehu entered into the gate 
she shouted out, had Zimri peace who slew his master? Now, what's all this mean? Zimri. Um, you might like to jot 1 Kings 16 verse 15 in your margin there because that's a reference back to Zimri. And this is the point. 44 years before, 44 years before, Zimri was a seven-day wonder. He was king for seven days. That's her point. So she's adorned herself. She looks like a queen. Gee, who's coming in? She said, you know what? You're a seven-day wonder. So that would have been a little bit intimidating, I think, to Jehu. Um, the ESV actually puts it even more aggressively. The ESV says, and as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, you, Zimri, murderer of your master? She actually names him as Zimri. So again, he was a commander um, in Israel who rebelled against the king. He claimed the throne and he lost his life after seven days. She knew her history. She threatened, and we might even say she bullied Jehu and said, you're just a seven-day wonder, mate. You're not going to last much longer than that. So here she is in great danger. She is hostile, she's arrogant, and she's insolent. That's the person that she was on the inside. And um, as we say, Zimri reigned all of one week until the word reached the army of Israel and they chose Omri who happened to be the father of Ahab that was the whole dynasty now so Zimri didn't last very long and the aftermath of his challenge was this whole dynasty of Ahab or Omri Ahab and Jezebel well verse 32 Jimri, uh, Jehu says who is on my side well you know we know what happened the narrative tells us nobody loved her even her own um, eunuchs, her attendants, uh, hated her. Uh, and he shouts out, uh, who is on my side? And I've just got to note, he probably would have been better to say, Exodus 32 verse 26, who is on Yahweh's side? All right. Remember in the challenge with the golden calf, it was Moses who stepped forward and said, who's on the Lord's side? And the tribe of Levi stepped up uh, to defend right values. Anyway, he said, who's on, who's on my side? And um, she got thrown out of the window. And of course, there she is crashing to the ground. You'll note the reference says, in verse 33, it says, throw her down. So she got through, thrown down. And then it says, some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall. I've got a little note that she fought all the way. It's not like, you know, she went easily. She would have scrabbled and fought with these uh, eunuchs and on the way down, you know, head smashed against the wall. She was, she was in a frenzy and um, eventually, of course, she crashed to the ground and it was a very ugly way to die, very, very violent, violent. And, of course, then on top of that, it says at the end of verse 33, he trod her underfoot. So Jehu drove his horses over a corpse, um, his chariot just sort of right over the top of Jezebel. It was just a, a horrible way to die, but Jehu was making sure that she died. There was nothing left to chance. It's like the arrow going through the heart. Jezebel fell down. He rode over her with a chariot because, like, hey, we don't want her coming back to life, life again. So what a horrible way to die, very dishonourable way. Uh, she, she took time to make herself look good on the outside, but in the end, she wasn't good on the inside. And, of course, the result was she lost, lost her life. And the record says there, in a, in a very bloodthirsty way, that there was blood splattered all over the place. It was on the wall, so if everybody saw it. Her body was broken as it hit the ground. It was consumed by the dogs. And we, we, we sort of step back from that narrative and say, well, it can't get much worse than that. I mean, that's a horrible, horrible description, but it actually does get even worse. Because from the narrative there, nobody bothered to care for, for her, nobody bothered to pick up the body. Jehu went in to eat. I mean, I guess it's probably been an exhausting day for him. <laughs> um, I don't know how he could eat after all that sort of thing happening. But um, he went in to, to eat, and of course, then someone gave him that information, you know, the body's still out there, what should we, we do? And uh, in verse 34, uh, he gives this command, go and see this cursed woman and bury it, for she's a king's daughter. Well, Jezebel did come from a very important lineage. She was 
the daughter of the king of Tyre. I don't know if you remember back when Ahab married her. She was a very significant person. She was the daughter of the king of Tyre. She was wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. She was the mother of Joram, the king of Israel, who just died as well. And um, she was the mother-in-law of the... Uh, or she was related to the king of Judah, and she was also the grandmother of Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So there's a whole family dynasty in there. Well, they sort of gave the information in verse 35 when they went out to bury her, uh, there, was, there was nothing left than her hands, her feet, and her skull. So this, of course, is very symbolic of the type of person that she was. So even, and this is the point, even the dogs who were wild scavengers in the streets in those days, and they were capable of scavenging and eating the most disgusting offal that they could, they couldn't even digest her you know, skull, that's her thoughts, her feet, her walk, or her hands, her actions. And a couple of quotations about dogs eating their own vomit, Proverbs 26.11, 2 Peter 2.22, both those uh, writers make reference to the scavenger dogs who would actually eat their own vomit. But they couldn't, they couldn't stomach uh, these remains of Jezebel. So there's you know, the lesson for us about our thoughts, our activity, our walk. And here are two great quotations really to put against verse 35 because this is really a characteristic of describing the way of life of people who completely reject God and do their own thing. It talks about their hands defiled with blood. I mean, you can read all that, mischief and lies and iniquity. The act of violence is in their hands, their feet run to evil, and their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. So there's the exact parallel there. And again, in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 19, six things Yahweh hates, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked imagination, and feet that are running to mischief. So again, there's that exact parallel to the, the whole approach of Jezebel. Opposite one, at least we, we, we do want to have a positive one because you know we don't want all this negativity to affect us and have nightmares tonight. <laughs> Psalm 24, verse 3 to 5. Who will ascend the hill of Yahweh? Who will stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hasn't lifted up his soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully, He'll receive the blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's, the great, that's where we want to be, brothers and sisters, isn't it? We've got to divest ourselves of all those uh, corruptions that infiltrate into our mind, the influence of the world. We want to step apart from all of that and to be able to stand with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a horrible, a horrible end as far as Jezebel was concerned. She lived a despicable life. She murdered innocent people. In some senses, there's a justness to the way she died. But of course there was nothing to bury. Um, you know, she was a great woman by her birth, by her connections, by her alliances, but her skeletal remains were thrown into the field of Naboth. No tomb, no spe special placard at all, nothing to say, well here lies Jezebel. And very appropriately Proverbs 10 verse 7 says, the memory of the just is blessed but the name of the wicked rot. And that's going to be true in, in its final statement. When our Lord Jesus Christ returns, uh, he's going to resurrect the faithful, their memories, their characters, their personalities, what they thought about, what they did with their lives, because they're the people that he, he loves and he wants. Others like Jezebel, of course, will be forgotten and remembered no more. You know, this is the last reference to Jezebel in the Bible, apart from one, from one, one reference. You know, it's almost as though the Bible closes and, and she's, she, she's forgotten. But there's one last reference moving forward in the Bible, and surprisingly it's in Revelation chapter 2 and verse, we won't go there, Revelation 2 verse 20 and 21. It's the only other reference to Jezebel, it's amazing. This is what it says. And I gave her space, Jezebel, to repent of her fornication. I'm just going to pause on that little section here. I gave her, this is God talking, or Jesus Christ through John. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. You know, when we step back and think about that phrase, that's from the time period that Elijah says Jezebel's body will be thrown in a ditch and the dogs will eat it. From the time that Elijah said that through the time of Jehu was 12 years. That was the space that God gave a woman like Jezebel to repent. Amazing. 
amazing the, the broadness of God's mercy and his love and his kindness, that even he would allow a space of time for a woman like Jezebel to change, make some different decisions. That's amazing. And I think that gives us a lot of encouragement because if God can be so gracious to a woman like Jezebel, then brothers and sisters, for you and me, his grace and his mercy is inestimable, wonderful, if we are going down the right pathway. So what do we take away from uh, tonight? <coughs> uh, four points. Jehu didn't hesitate to target and to use his full strength for God's service. What level of service are you comfortable with? Like we sort of get comfortable at a certain level because you know what? We look at what everyone else is doing and we sort of just adjust ourselves to that. But when we compare ourselves to Christ 24-7, a very short life, 33 and a half years of full service, then you know, maybe we, can, we need to lift our, our service, our level, our enthusiasm. Jehu remembered a conversation that he had you know, 15 years before and he waited patiently for the fulfilment of a prophecy. Are we ready to be involved in the new government to be established by Christ? So this is not a rest period for us that's awaiting us. It's a reinventing, a rejuvenation of the world itself. We want to be part of that. Will we have the energy and enthusiasm? Well, we'll be immortal, of course. But, you know, the mindset now is, are we ready to go? And when we go, will we give full strength? Well, we've got to do that now, of course, as a demonstration of our connection to Christ. Thirdly, are we discerning with our friendships or could they be leading us to disaster? Again, there's these two kings, Joram and Ahaziah. Disastrous friendship, ended in their death. We have to be careful with where we go in our friendships. And finally, head, hands and feet. What have they been doing this last week? Will Christ want to preserve our thoughts, our activity and our direction as part of our godly character? They're the great lessons, practical lessons from the life of Jehu, which will continue in a couple of weeks.